everybody. I'm Kate Meese, Associate Director at the Local Government Commission. I'm going to provide a brief overview and some logistics for our webinar and then turn it over to our speakers. This is the 13th of 15 webinars we're hosting over three years through the Statewide Energy Efficiency Collaborative, which is a partnership between LGC, ICLE, the Institute for Local Government, and the four investor-owned utilities. The partnership was established in the 2009 CPUC decision to help cities and counties reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save energy. A little bit about what the webinar logistics before we get started. Due to the large number of participants, everyone will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions at any time during the webinar, go ahead and put them in the question box on the control panel and include the name of the speaker your question is intended for so that we know who to have answer it. If you're having technical difficulties, write IT in the question box, followed by the problem you are experiencing. We'll be trying to answer as many questions as possible using the chat function during the presentations. At the end, we'll summarize the remaining questions for the speakers during the question and answer portion at the end of each presentation. The presentations from the webinar are available on our website. We'll also be adding a recording of the webinar once it is available. When the webinar concludes, you will be asked to complete a survey. Please take five minutes to provide us with the input, which helps us to improve our future webinars. This webinar is focused on communicating energy projects and getting the buy-in of your community and elected officials. We decided to pursue this topic because we found that while Polls show that the majority of Californians believe in climate change and the need to address, address it, including through reducing energy use. The public's reaction to local projects and planning efforts don't always reflect that reality. A recent poll from Public Policy Institute of California shows that 60% of Californians say that the effects of global warming have already begun. 78% of Californians think that the world's temperature probably has been going up over the past 100 years. And three in four Californians think that global warming is a serious threat to the economy and to the quality of life of Californians in the future. And there is support for efforts to address climate change and strategies to reduce energy use and vehicle miles traveled. Most Californians think it is necessary to take steps to counter the effects of global warming right away. More than three in four favor requiring an increase in energy efficiency for residential and commercial buildings and appliances. And a majority also believe that local governments should um, be encouraged to change land use and transportation planning so that people could drive less. So despite the fact that there's broad support for this work and a myriad of benefits associated with energy and climate change projects, many local governments are facing strong opposition. Even when these opponents are in the mi minority, they can successfully draw out or derail projects. This webinar will highlight tools and resources to help local governments, staff, and electeds su successfully engage, in the community, engage the community in energy efficiency projects and climate action planning. Our speakers will provide guidance on how to communi communicate the benefits of energy efficiency, climate action planning, and greenhouse gas reductions and how to conduct a successful public engagement process to a broad audience. We have a great list of speakers today, starting with Terry Amsler. Terry directs the Institute for Local Government's Public Engagement Program, which promotes and supports effective and inclusive public engagement in California's cities and counties. Terry will start us off by discussing how to plan and implement successful public engagement programs. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to be with you. Um, I'm speaking about, uh, as you know, responding to contested views and values in public engagement processes. This is just uh, one part, of course. And I, I guess I should say I'm talking about this mainly in context of formal public engagement processes. There's a much larger scan and uh, or li larger uh, scope of public engagement, of course, but hopefully talking about this work uh, will be useful to you and relevant. Perhaps it's increasingly so for the reasons that uh, have been stated already. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've already talked about the Institute for Local Government's mission. I'll just say again that we're a, a nonprofit arm of the League of California Cities and the California State Association of Counties and have a lot of materials on our website that uh, you may find relevant. Uh, next slide. 
So, so the purpose here is really to help develop your capacity to design and implement public engagement processes with the greatest chance of success where there are strongly contested values and views. So and you note that I said greatest chance of success. So there's little perfection in the world. Uh, this is hard work to do. And also, everything is very situational. I mean, everything I say certainly are offered as considerations, certainly not prescriptions, because what's happening on the ground where you are in your communities will really tell the story of what needs to happen, what the best approach will be. There's also, I should probably say, there's a lot of attention to Tea Party and Agenda 21 and so on and so forth right now, and with, with reason. Um, and we've even provided in the resource slides at the end of my slideshow some, some information relevant to some of these groups uh, from all different perspectives. But it's, my job here today is not so much to focus on a particular organization or group or anything like that. But I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned from both the challenges and the uh, success stories that are happening about how to reach out uh, and involve people when there really are these great chasms of views and values. The next slide, please. Um, we use sort of a general, uh, this general schemata here for talking about public engagement with local officials. I'm only going to talk about it very quickly, but it's sort of a flow chart for thinking through public engagement efforts. And I just want to make uh, maybe a couple general comments uh, because I don't have time to go into all the public engagement sort of strategies. But you'll note that we want to move from the left from sort of developing purposes of public engagement and clarifying what those are into issue framing before going into the actual development of the participants and process and so forth. This issue framing area is probably under attended to. For any kind of engagement efforts, you've got, it really is worth spending some time on thinking clearly what exactly are the issues and how are we going to frame these questions uh, upon which we wish to engage the public via their input or their actions. It's, a, it's just an area where it, you'll benefit by taking some time on the language and, and the purpose of that. And then you'll note in the box, we start with participants in the middle. This is really just good communication skills in theory in some way. But participants precede process. And so we talk about purpose, participants, then process in public engagement design. So thinking through your participants, understanding the participants, thinking about who you want to be participants, who you want to involve, is really critical to the success of any public engagement effort. Uh, next slide, please. Um, people can contest very different things, and they do. They can contest the topic itself that's under discussion. They can contest or have really strong opinions about the local or regional agency or officials that are involved or CBOs involved. Or they may have real strong concerns about the planning or public engagement process itself. So the first thing to say is simply these are different things and, and may generate different appropriate responses uh, in the effort that you're making. Uh, they also may affect design in some ways very basically who you put up in front of a room to speak about the, the efforts uh, that you have in mind. The other thing I should say probably generally about just any strongly dealing with any situation where there are very strongly strongly held concerns and expressions of those concerns is they're often hard to hear. Especially when things get hot, there's a lot of research that suggests that people don't hear as well as they do otherwise. And so again, just for any effort that you're doing, you want people involved who are able to do this work well. We're able to, to deal with really conflictual and, and, and hot and heated and uh, strongly different views if you're talking again, as I am, about public engagement processes and who's, who's going to be involved. So the first, I don't want to say rule, perhaps consideration is to think about your likely participants. This is the next slide. Um, again, this is an area which is not perhaps done enough to think, again, it's just good communications and marketing. Who do you want to have involved and who do you think will be involved? Um, some sort of stakeholder analysis here, and which simply means to me simply thinking a bit about people who might participate and what their interests and, and attitudes and values are is really worth doing. How are they going to view the opportunity for public engagement? What are their assumptions? What gaps in information do they have? What are their past experiences in other settings? It's well worth taking some time to learn about this. And that includes learning from other jurisdictions and the work that they've done. Increasingly, I think we want to see what others have done and what's worked. And you also, again, we want to develop your design after you've thought about and you've this, this question of participation. Next slide, please. The other really important point I'd want to raise is about the notion of planning, preparing, and providing information. Um, 
one of the things that Marin County did in, was dealing with some pension reform issues. So they really worked very hard to develop, uh, to, to re reach out to the organized groups who had very strong opinions about pensions and pension reforms and public pensions in general, and really involve them in thinking about the process for some sort of public engagement event that would take place. Uh, this can be done in a variety of ways. Not all is successful, of course. Uh, in this case, in Marin County, they ultimately did not succeed in having folks um, kind of coming in as a co-sponsor, uh, but they did uh, draw speakers from the group, and there was a certain amount of relationship and understanding that was built before they went forward. And, and this notion of having speakers and participants who really reflect diverse populations is important. If people are asked to participate and their views are not in the room in some way, shape, or form, that's probably going to be a problem. In the, um, the next item, the next bullet, rather, ensure sponsor and facilitator clarity, especially in, a, in what may become a heated situation, having great clarity between the sponsors of a public engagement activity and those that are facilitating or in the room is really important beforehand, especially if things go south, as they say. You're going to want to have folks really on the, same, on the same page about how it's going to be handled. Part of this is preparing and having the right meeting facilitators. You want folks that are generally going to be perceived as impartial, uh, so it's not to provide sort of red meat for folks that want to uh, raise issues. And you want to, you're going to want them to have a real clear sense of their role, and, 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 uh, and, and especially if, again, things get contentious. The watch your language item, that means a couple of different things. One, it means look, watch your jargon. The other, it means watch for your unintended assumptions, perhaps, uh, behind the language that you're using, or suggested by the language you're using. And the other part to that, excuse me, just want to take a drink of water, pardon me. The other thing is that you want to watch your language in terms of if you really think about the language that draws out contested value propositions when you don't want them drawn out, it's probably not the best way to start. So if you're thinking about doing public engagement efforts, it just goes back to the issue framing piece as well. What is the language you want to use? Is it language that's going to draw in people to participate or suggest divisions before you start? Next slide, please. In terms of designing appropriate process, there's, there's too much that could be said in this area. So I'm going to try to just focus in probably some hopefully practical ways. Uh, you certainly want to design in flexibility. You want to have a plan B if things are not going well. You want to provide information and opportunities for learning before and at the, op the, the engagement opportunity. Folks are, for a variety of things like pension reform, like climate change, energy, uh, regional planning, these are very uh, um, uh, complicated issues, certainly, and people will not have information in the best of times often in terms of what they're coming into. So you really need to take some time and find different ways and opportunities before and during the meeting to bring people up to speed to have the information they need. You shouldn't ask people to participate in a way if they don't have the information to participate. That doesn't mean people have to be experts to participate, but the, your process ought to reflect what people do know. In terms of this acknowledge underlying policy history assumptions and restrictions on action and so forth. That's simply to say, to make it clear where, it's, where this process, this question, this issue, where it started and where it's going. Uh, there are, you kind of ask for trouble again if there's not clarity in the room about where what you're asking people to do now, where it fits in this large continuum. And then this notion of meeting reasonable process needs and interests of those likely to attend. This is, of course, the word reasonable here is, is important. But there's two or three areas that seem to be coming up in a number of issue settings, including climate change, regional planning, and others, that, that are maybe worth mentioning. One is this whole notion of questions and answers. Many uh, groups are coming in really wanting almost any public engagement effort to consist primarily of opportunities for them to ask questions and get answers. And if there's not that component there, they see it as very suspect thus questioning a lot of the liberation efforts that really use small groups, and we'll come to that in a minute. There's different ways to handle this. You can build in, obviously, questions and answer periods uh, during a more deliberative public engagement event. You can make an, uh, make an effort mainly questions and answers, or you can hold really different meetings at different times with different focus. It was interesting, again, back to Marin County that I, that I happened to sit in on. They really, given what they saw as the, the, the contestation that was going to be uh, going to be in the room no matter what, uh, when and, and how the thing was set up. They made this first, this first public engagement effort primarily an informational one, 
with a lot of people at the front of the room speaking and providing information with, from different perspectives. It was a complex issue. People needed information. And it was really quite successful in providing information, and everyone felt pretty good about it, I think. Um, so again, the question and answer piece is increasingly, seemingly, an issue for many. The other uh, issue that's coming up is that of, of small groups. There are, in Marin as well, and certainly other places, uh, people have come in saying, we're not, if it's booms to small groups, we're not participating. Uh, this happened in Marin, for instance, and uh, when they went, to, they went to a small group session only to allow people to think about, prioritize the questions they wanted to ask, and people left the room. Now, it's, there, there's various ways to handle this as well. It begins, again depends on the purpose of the meetings. But you, wouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised to find challenges with the whole notion of small group work. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. The other is this notion of closed choices. We're seeing a fair amount of, 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 of pushback where there are scenarios or options or views or action opportunities that are a closed choice. People cannot say no, none of the above. And people have a lot of questions about it. And uh, excuse me, I'll hit my screen here. Um, so the, the, this is another area where I think you want to be careful and plan carefully as you're thinking about public engagement of, uh, activities, more formal in nature, this questions and answers, small groups, and this notion of closed choices. And frankly, I think you can give people a none of the above choice generally, and that's not a bad idea. Um, this uh, bullet, second to last bullet point on this slide, consider processes that seek common ground. There are certainly public engagement processes, consensus building processes, that allow people to work together to find common ground against very contested territory. These also, however, tend to take a bit of time. They assume a certain amount of, a certain amount of willingness to, for people to participate in them. They generally require some good facilitation. <coughs> Excuse me and really a broad participation where you have different views in the room and they're willing to talk together. This isn't always possible. Sometimes it is. Again, we're talking today about, I'm talking anyway, about a fairly small slice of larger public engagement efforts that could be done. But if you're going to take an effort to do something that really seeks to build common ground, that's not going to happen right away. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't assume that it's going to be too easy. There are sometimes, I think people get sold a bill of goods sometimes on certain public engagement processes that they will accomplish too much in, a, in, in, the, in the amount of time they have. So I think you have to be realistic about that. And focus on doable work. And frankly, sometimes not tying a public engagement effort immediately closely to a decision, where people tend to be even more kind of ramped up to some extent. But backing it up and moving it into more of a dialogue kind of opportunity, where people are just getting together to share and learn information, allows the kind of sharing and back and forth and joint learning and coming to the more common ground that might be possible and otherwise be the case. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. The other, the other point in terms of, uh, I suppose, uh, keeping in mind would be transparency is almost always your friend. So you manage your public engagement meetings transparently, transparently, describing meeting goals and processes, what happened next, and also what happens before. Again, put the entire meeting, the entire effort in context for folks. Uh, agreement on ground rules are as important. Some are calling these courtesy guidelines, and now I see, and I'm not sure how much different that difference that makes. It is interesting, I suppose, from a value perspective that do we value more courtesy or rules? Uh, one might say courtesy, and that may help developing these guidelines will work for your meetings. Um, again, this notion of questions and how comments will be handled is really important because it will often be a, a factor for certainly more organized groups coming in in some cases. So. Be as clear about that as you can. And again, this uh, the final bullet there, showing respect and partiality and good listening. You may not be able to move the unmovable, but you can influence the unsure in the room. And respect and partiality and good listening will help you do that. Next slide, please. Um, so you may get into a situation, however, where there really is uh, some negative, challenging, or emotionally presented comments. And, and again, uh, these meetings can be challenging. Uh, Again, these things are not all the same, so you want to listen well. And the other thing in, in these meetings I've found, again, help it, people can help each other out. Watching one person in front of the room slowly suffer is not the best strategy. And if, if uh, folks on the team can be useful, can break in, it's very hard when people are being jumped on to keep your wits about you. So the preparation on this, to think it through ahead of time, what the options are, how you're going to respond, who's going to help, who will say what, is really worth thinking about. 
there's a there's a there's a, this ALDD idea, the third bullet on this slide, which I, I can't attribute it because I can't figure out where it comes from. But it's this notion that for any comment that might be made, you have to do something with it. You may acknowledge it and legitimate it, assuming it's not an attack. And then you have to defer, delegate or, de delegate, or deal. And pretty much you do one or the other. And you have to do something. You can't sort of, you know, just sort of ignore things. So thinking ahead of time about the kind of issues that might come up, the kind of challenges, and know whether you're going to defer, delegate, or deal can also be a helpful strategy to think about. Um, you also, another strategy that's been talked about in a few quarters, has been when someone's challenging you with a piece of information that uh, you may not believe is the case, you can ask them for their source of that information. You can provide, you can say there's other sources of information such as, and provide those information as well. And then finally on this slide, uh, however, if there are personal attacks in a public engagement effort, you can't let them slide. I mean, you just, you have to be clear about that, that this is not okay, and you have to take whatever steps will happen. Uh, the next slide is just a con continuation. I'll be brief on these, I'm just about done. Um, if appropriate, you can ask the group for guidance if things get, 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 get challenging. That depends, though, if you have a pretty good sense of where you think the group will go. Um, you can also suggest breaks. You do control the time uh, and the breaks and the agenda. Uh, feel, take the breaks, use them. Uh, talk with folks uh, during the breaks as appropriate. Um, and generally be aware that people who, don't, who, people who do not feel heard are likely to speak the loudest. However, this attention to this issue really starts well before any kind of public engagement meeting. It should start with relationship building and, and reaching out before then. And so if people are disruptive, and very briefly, because um, this is not the normal, I, I think this is not the norm, and even sometimes just people being loud or people being firm or people being challenging is not necessarily disruptive. Um, you can obviously review and enforce the ground rules or courtesy guidelines you prefer. Keep control of the microphone. Again, you can ask the group whether they wish to continue to move to a formal process. One very really basic step I've seen is if you're trying to move, say, people to small groups, and there's a vocal minority saying, no, we shouldn't do this for one reason or another, you can say, for instance, well, why don't those folks who are ready to move to small group go ahead, and I'm willing, I'll st uh, I or Mary or Joseph or Jose will stay with those folks who'd like to, and see if we can, who don't want to do that, we'll see if we can find another process for them. So there are ways to move things forward and not get embroiled in a conversation back and forth that you simply can't not only not win, but doesn't, doesn't um, uh, um, uh, achieve or advance your agenda. Um, and then obviously if things do get out of hand, you, have to, you may have to state the next steps and conclude the meeting. I encourage everybody to talk to your local agency attorney about the rules on that. So in summary, I think learn from others. Next slide. Learn from others. Think really carefully about your likely participants. Uh, one item that's not there might be this notion of framing your issues well. Uh, uh, ensure clarity among your sponsors and facil facilitators. Inform and include participants and start early. Practice transparency. Fit the process or processes to the folks you have, and there's an asterisk there only to mean to the degree humanly possible than the capacity and resources you have, and prepare for what's if. So I will just close there. You'll see there's a number of resources you might find interesting. Again, I think some of the Agenda 21 and such can be helpful not only because you want to look at or think about Agenda 21 or such, but they help us think more broadly about how to address issues that are contested uh, and where people have strongly held beliefs. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Great presentation. We really appreciate all the strategies for planning and conducting a successful public process. We don't have any questions currently for Terry. So if, if anyone has a question, as a reminder, we are using the chat function for those. Um, we'll move on to the next speaker, but we will have time towards the end to get back to any questions for Terry or any of the speakers. Up next, we have Don Knapp, who will provide guidance on how to successfully communicate the benefits of climate change and energy efficiency efforts. Don is a communications and marketing director at ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability USA. Don leads their communication strategy and marketing efforts. He authored ICLE's Climate Communication for Local Governments Guide, and he developed ICLE's training materials on communicating sustainability and responding to critics. So I will turn it over to Don. Hi, everyone, and, and thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Um, my name is Don. I'm with ICLE, and um, 
<clears throat> I'm going to talk about some communications challenges today and how you can overcome them. Next slide, please. Uh, I think everybody on the call should be basically familiar with ICLEI. We're the leading network of local governments who are working on climate action, clean energy, and sustainability issues in the United States and around the world. We have a thousand members worldwide, and we support them with networks and tools, technical guidance, and trainings. You can learn more about us at icleiusa.org. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I want to cover, or, or really I should say why I'm talking, is um, we want to tackle this issue of how we explain why climate and energy issues matter for local governments. Why should people care? There's a lot of competing priorities these days. There's fiscal budget crises. There's crime. There's many local issues that are, are uh, on the front burner and very relevant. How do we um, communicate climate and energy and, and why your local government is taking action on these issues? Uh, how do we describe the local challenges and opportunities we're facing? And how do we attract people to the table for a healthy dialogue? Um, all kinds of community stakeholders. So that's kind of um, the problem, as I see it, or the challenge. And next slide. What I want to go through today are just some really basic, I think, common sense strategies um, for clear and compelling and values-driven communication. I think it's obviously more important than ever, especially since climate and energy issues have really become so contentious. And I want to invite you to think about climate communication as a way to build relationships, not uh, as a, a means to win a debate or convince people to think the same way. So you build relationships when you understand your audience and you speak to their values and priorities. So I'm going to go over uh, some guidelines. Next, next slide, please. I think they're very general and flexible. I think they can be of use to you when you are uh, doing climate action planning preparation work. You're trying to get stakeholders or a steering committee together, um, or you're actually in the engagement process, or maybe you're presenting your greenhouse gas uh, inventory results to city council, or you are engaging your elected officials about um, uh, getting their buy-in for climate and energy work, or, or um, you are defending your existing programs and your actions, um, uh, talking about why your local government uh, has a climate program or is doing energy work and what the benefits and results are. So uh, these are my four communications guidelines, and let's jump into them. Next slide, please. So number one, know your audience. This is a, a fundamental underlying concept in effective communication. Uh, effective communication is targeted communication. That means you know your audience, you're speaking their language, your messages resonate because they are relevant. And of course, this is critical for uh, climate and energy communication uh, when you're engaging a diversity of stakeholders in your community, neighborhood group leaders, business leaders, religious leaders. Uh, understand that each group uh, has its own motivations for supporting local climate action or, or energy action. Uh, that might be job creation, saving money, uh, stewardship of the land. So uh, when you know your audience, you're going to be able to tailor your messages uh, to them. And uh, uh, inherent in this is finding credible speakers to deliver that message. Um, again, that's another Im important underlying concept in communication. For example, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, in building support for their sustainability plan, they brought in um, a U.S. Army consultant to talk about why the Army is focused on sustainability initiatives. And that really resonated with their local audience, many of whom were retired military. Next slide. Uh, speak to shared values. Uh, the most effective communication speaks to people's guts, not their minds. Um, it, is, uh, it, it reaches them on an emotional level. So it's important to consider what values drive people's decisions and beliefs in your community. So I, I think before you embark on a climate action planning process, give some thought to this. What are values that are important in your community? Is it issues like prosperity, um, balancing environment and uh, economic issues? Is freedom and individual rights um, uh, a strong uh, issue in your community? And then. Uh, take it a step further and think about uh, um, how those values translate into policies and, and priorities. Um, you know, reducing waste, preserving open space and parks, job creation, uh, reducing childhood asthma rates. Okay, next slide. Uh, 
So you should understand which climate change messages may conflict or align with your audience's core values. Uh, the, the goal here is to make sure that you're respecting your audience's beliefs and that you're framing climate change in a way um, that they can relate to. So an example of not framing climate change information would just be to dump uh, a bunch of climate science and statistics on your audience with no easy way for them to relate to what it means or how it relates to their lives. Um, as Kate said in the beginning, I think it's really, really important to recognize that broad support exists for climate action initiatives, even among people who don't really believe in climate change as, as a human-caused issue. So surveys um, have found that people support bike lanes. Uh, they want them in their community. Uh, people support clean energy. Uh, people support uh, having more transportation choices. And I think it's really, rec uh, really important to recognize that and, and determine what is your lead topic, what is your entree for talking, for having a conversation about climate action, um, which opens the door for a secondary conversation on greenhouse gas reductions. I think we have to be realistic that today, um, different than, say, five years ago, we're not going to have as much success if we start talking about um, GHG emissions reductions. There's, um, there's usually something that... Uh, is going to open the door, and I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. Just a quick little concept. I think it's um, it's kind of a neat way to think about values and your messaging. Uh, create a values sandwich, and I got this idea from the Sightline Institute. Next slide. Um, when you're putting together this sandwich, here's the recipe. You you start out by saying why an issue matters to your family and uh, or your community, how it speaks to values. Uh, and then you give your data, or you talk about a policy solution. And then you repeat your message again, why it matters. So that, that's really the take home here. Are you just giving people unfiltered data, or are you stressing why something matters? Are you couching that? OK, uh, next slide. Guideline number three, talk in local, immediate terms about uh, climate and energy issues. So in the minds of most Americans, as I think we all know, um, Climate change is not uh, an urgent issue on par with our economy or jobs. Um, I think that uh, certainly the concern is growing, uh, but um, you have to talk about this issue in a way that brings it alive and makes it personal if you want your elected officials, your community members, your municipal colleagues to care about it. So you have to bring it home, make it local, tangible, in the here and now. Talk about the impacts that you are seeing on the ground in your community or the predicted impacts, the heat waves. What is it doing to your infrastructure, uh, flooding or drought issues? Um, what are the public health concerns uh, that you're going to talk about? Again, far, far more effective than showing a graphic of Al Gore's hockey stick. So. Really keep that in mind. I think that that is the key. Um, there is some growing evidence that talking about climate change impacts and adaptation is a better lead than talking uh, about uh, climate science and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you're, you're working to get people to care about this issue, to help them understand why it matters right now, not in 2050, um, not in the next generation, why it matters to them and their children now. Um, one example of this in uh, the city of Boston during their climate action planning process, um, they, they brought it home. They talked about the local impacts. Uh, here's what we're seeing now. Here's what we're predicted to see in the next several decades, sea level rise, heat waves, flooding. Uh, as if to remind your participants, this is why we're here talking about climate change right now. Uh, one effective line of questioning that they used was they asked their participants um, to write down and discuss uh, what are you most concerned about? What motivates you as an individual to take action to prevent climate change? And then an even better question, what do you think motivates your neighbor uh, to take action on climate change? So they got them thinking in these local terms and in these personal terms. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a shocker here. Uh, emphasize solutions and opportunities when you talk about climate change. I think um, we can all agree on that. People prefer to hear about solutions, not problems. Climate change is a scary issue. There's evidence that shows that when you really uh, scare people and it, it seems like an overwhelming problem for which there is no solution, people shut down, and that's when they begin to deny. So 
I think the good news is we have practical solutions. We have common sense, low risk solutions that you can talk about what your local government is doing and show that, yeah, this is a serious issue, uh, our climate challenges, our energy challenges as well, um, but, uh, but they are not insurmountable. We can take action. Um, making solutions seem like a no-brainer, emphasizing the return on investment, uh, and then finding the most effective frame for your messaging in your community. What do you think is going to resonate with your audience? Is it making climate change a public health issue and talking about the air quality uh, impacts? Is it talking about stewardship of the land and, and, um, and creation? Is it talking about resilience? Is it talking about economic prosperity and jobs and, and those opportunities? So there are many different effective frames. It's not like you have to use one, but give it some thought. W which one is going to resonate for your audience? Next slide. Um, and then just emphasizing one in frame in particular, win on economic terms. Um, it, it is almost unassailable way to talk about um, the work you're doing. And connect the dots. Uh, climate change, uh, energy issues, and economic issues are all intertwined. I don't see uh, successful local governments just talking about climate change. They're always connecting the dots between these opportunities and these co-benefits. Next slide. Uh, I have some sample messages here. I'm not going to read them off, but they're here for you to reference when you look at the recorded uh, or the um, the PDF of these slides. Um, next slide. Uh, I really like the way San Antonio messages their sustainability work in their Mission Verde plan. Uh, they talk about economic opportunity. They, they talk about economic competitiveness. We cannot be left behind. We have to do all these things. We can have a better community. We can have a stronger economy. I think their messaging is spot on, and it's really worked for them. Next slide, please. So I, I know I'm running out of time, but I want to talk a little bit about responding to attacks um, and opposition to your programs, be it people who don't think you're doing enough or people who think that you shouldn't be doing any sort of planning on uh, climate change or sustainability or energy. So, uh, and, and these are some strategies that I have uh, given to ICLE members, as I think everybody knows, they have um, come under attack around the uh, Agenda 21 issue, but uh, we don't want to limit it to just that issue. So I think that these, uh, these tips are broader than that. Strategy number one, find your positive message and stick with it. Everything I explained before, your message about why uh, climate and energy action is important and relevant in your community, what are the benefits. Um, if you have a good message, you can stick with it. You don't have to change your message if it comes under attack. You know it has broad support. Next slide. Okay, so emphasize impacts, return on investment, local benefits, tap values. Um, when you come under attack, it's an opportunity for you to build support and an awareness of what you're doing to showcase your leadership. Next slide. Uh, when these attacks happen, it's really, really important to proactively educate and inform your elected officials about both sides of the issue so that nobody's blindsided. You want to make sure everyone is responding consistently, that everyone is on message. Um, and then one little option here is um, if, if there are activists who oppose your work, consider having a private conversation with them. Um, anybody who gets up in, in front of a microphone on a podium, that is a highly charged atmosphere. It's, it's not the venue for a productive discussion. Next slide. Okay, reframing the conversation is a really important communication strategy. Uh, people want to make a conversation about their issue, about um, you know, what they're bringing to the table, be it a conspiracy theory or you know, something along those lines. Um, and, and you're talking about your climate and energy work. You don't want the conversation to be on those terms. You want to talk about why you're doing the work, uh, why this issue is relevant locally. You want to talk about the local solutions, the, the local benefits, the need for local dialogues. We, we're here to talk at this meeting about the future of our community. What kind of community do we want? Uh, what are the issues that are important to us? Next slide. And again, in, in this reframing the conversation uh, tip, be hyperlocal. Continually reference why an initiative or a program matters, why it's important locally, what are the benefits. Um, oftentimes in these scenarios where a program is under attack, people want to broaden it to talk about issues that really have nothing to do with your community or conspiracies that are far, far bigger than your community. You have to bring it back home and, uh, and talk about 
again, why it's important locally. Next slide. Emphasize uh, consensus and local control. You have to show uh, that your initiatives have broad community support. Uh, highlight past elected official support. Highlight past community uh, input and support. Um, I think that's really important. And um, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, I want to give a little case study of uh, San Carlos, California, which is a, um, a small community in Silicon Valley that dealt with these issues. Um, you can forward to the next slide, I believe. Um, San Carlos dealt with uh, these attacks, and I think they handled them in an exemplary way. Um, they did all the things that I was talking about. They, they gave a clear explanation at the city council meeting about why they're doing their green programs. They're based on local priorities. Uh, they're based on past support. They're based on state mandates for why they have to address uh, climate and environmental initiatives. Uh, they explained the value and the role of their ICLE membership in meeting their local goals, why they joined ICLE. And uh, you know, one extra thing that they did that I think was particularly effective is they compiled all of the accusations uh, that they were getting around their environmental work. And they addressed them very logically and calmly. Um, this was by the assistant city manager speaking before city council and really shined a light on some of these accusations that, that really withered under that light. They did not have any supporting evidence, and yet um, you know, they were given, all of these accusations were given respect, and, um, and he had answers for, for all of them. So uh, in that situation, the city council decided to uh, reaffirm their ICLE membership on the spot, and I think it was a success story of how this can be handled. Um, so next slide. I'm going to wrap up. Uh, again, when you're reframing the conversation in, in scenarios like this, just remember that um, you have your message and you have a strong message. Don't respond with language that reinforces uh, the opposition's frame and furthers you into a nebulous debate that's very off topic from what your program is about or what your uh, planning scenario is about, why you've gathered people together to talk about climate and energy issues. So that's it for me. Uh, if you want more information, you can go to ICLEI's website. You can find our Climate Communication for Local Governments Guide. It's free. If you have further questions, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, ICLEI has a lot of uh, communications materials for local Happy to provide them with you. Thanks, Hello? Colin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we lost you I for a second, I but I, I think they they got that they can reach out to you if there are any further questions. So thanks for sharing your strategies with us, some really good tips on framing and communicating um, around energy and climate projects. So we really appreciate you joining us. And we will move on to our last speaker. Again, if there are any questions, please go ahead and use the chat function to send those over to us. So council member John Harrison is going to conclude the webinar. He has championed sustainability initiatives, including the preparation and adoption of the City of Redlands Community Sustainability Plan. So he'll be sharing with us his experience building support for that plan. John has been a council member in Redlands since 2001, including four years as mayor and serves as our vice chairman on the Local Government Commission's Board of Directors. So I will turn it over now to Council Member Harrison. Thanks, Kate. Appreciate it. Uh, I w if you can go ahead and go on to the next slide, I'll you know, jump right into things here. I wanted to start real briefly with going over what we, uh, how we approached our sustainability plan. We use the Institute for Local Government Best Practices materials, and they really provided a great structure for us to move forward. Our plan was prepared entirely by volunteers. There were no city dollars used at all. We uh, and many cities face that situation. But by having the um, ILG's uh, best practices materials, we really had a common denominator for our experts in each of these areas to understand what, uh, what one another was bringing to the process of preparing the plan. And while I thought our act Climate Action Task Force would draw a great deal on the specific actions in the ILG materials, 
they actually really use those as their la launching pad and use their own uh, expertise and their own knowledge of local conditions to come up with the uh, goals and actions that are contained in our plan. And I have a link to our plan on the last slide of this presentation. So, uh, next slide, please. So I, I bring up the chronology just to point out that we had we started back in November of 2008. I had attended the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, Climate Action uh, Conference up in Seattle, and that really motivated me to uh, undertake preparing a plan, but having no funding available, uh, convinced the council uh, and through unanimous vote to proceed on this effort, but using a volunteer effort. And while we had we had one staff liaison to make sure we had connectivity back to staff, it was essentially a, a citizen-driven process. In uh, January of 2010, uh, we had completed our meetings. We met monthly uh, to develop the different ch chapters of the plan. And we uh, were ready to release that in January, but the uh, brouhaha over Prop 23 had already started, kind of the pre preparatory steps for that. And so we uh, really, the, the council leadership changed. Uh, we were, I was replaced as mayor by uh, a, a woman running for assembly who uh, wanted to support Prop 23. So we just pulled back on pushing the plan through at that time and went out and did additional public outreach, got a lot, a lot more uh, support for the plan, gathered some additional information, and we're then prepared by June to bring the for plan forward once the uh, City Council elections took place later that year. Shortly thereafter, then in March, we were able to adopt the plan unanimously and uh, move forward with I implementation. And what was a surprise to me is then in March of, of this year, uh, a citizens group of its own volition really formed to start implementing the plan. So they had read the plan, seen the plan, and were motivated by trying to make some of these things happen in town, and they are very active now in pursuing uh, areas of specific interest to, to, uh, for their uh, areas of expertise. So it, we've been very successful, I guess, in Redlands in having it be uh, more of a community-driven than a, a city staff-driven process, and it, it definitely uh, helps with the buy-in to do, to do that. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think some of the things we experienced when we were uh, building the plan as well as afterwards uh, really echo what Terry and Don have been describing in terms of emphasizing uh, real practical solutions and keeping the focus very, very local. That's what we've done and it's been uh, quite successful. So keeping it tangible, rather than we did not get into things like uh, measuring the amount of uh, CO2 that each activity was going to uh, uh, reduce because that's not something that people can touch and feel, whereas we could talk about we're going to reduce the energy used by our air conditioners by 10 percent, which saves this kind of money, and oh, by the way, it reduces carbon emissions by this amount. So we really focused on projects. In fact, we haven't really gotten into the uh, systematic measurement of the progress we're making, but we know we are making progress, and that's, that's I guess, what we've had to sacrifice, not having the uh, funding to really have a deep staff involvement. We, uh, right from the beginning, the very first conversation of our task force that for prepared the plan, and ever since then, we've always focused on any actions we take must have a positive economic effect, or at least be neutral economically. We knew we needed the business community buy-in here in Redland, so we made sure that that was always a first consideration. And for every one of our uh, actions that we have in the plan, we indicate how we feel it's going to have a positive economic impact. Uh, we've uh, kept it uh, entirely a voluntary. All our actions are identified as voluntary because uh, here, and as, as I imagine in many communities, uh, re mandating that or uh, requiring that citizens or businesses participate in certain programs is, is not going to be received very well. For our city actions that we've taken, things like uh, we're, uh, uh, the, the uh, air conditioning improvements or the uh, we're about to start a, an LED streetlight program, we've really emphasized cost savings to the city. So rather than talking about uh, the uh, amount of CO2 reduction, we've really emphasized that this is going to save 
so many thousands of dollars per year ongoing, so it will pay for itself and then enable those funds to be available for other priorities in the community. And that really has, I think, dampened any opposition, whether it was the council members that uh, had skepticism about climate change or the community. It's really helped to show how the actions we're taking are really uh, contributing to uh, keeping services high, yet keeping you know, continuing to drive costs down. And don't hesitate uh, as you're moving forward to take credit for what was done before sustainability became uh, a hot topic. Uh, California has been uh, you know, in the forefront of all these activities even before AB 32. So things like the switching over trash trucks to uh, CNG and liquefied natural gas, uh, a lot of other actions, switching your uh, traffic lights out to LED. All those actions that you may have done in the past, they've actually contributed to reducing uh, carbon footprint. And there's no sense to not acknowledge them as part of the ongoing efforts that your community has been making uh, for, for many, many years. And the last thing we did to kind of continue to build support for our program was to have a real simple a community awards program. It was just what we called a green uh, certificate of, or a green certificate. And uh, it would, we would give it to anybody that ha we felt had done something to make a personal contribution to reducing their footprint. So many people had put solar on roofs. We gave them a certificate. We had uh, one hair salon that uh, had been collecting all the hair clippings because they could send those to a company that turned that into mats to, to absorb oil when you have an oil spill. Uh, and we had, of course, uh, we have a local business that's been in the heating air conditioning for over 50 years, small local business, and they sell very energy efficient equipment. So we wanted to highlight that as a way of promoting that business as well as uh, the benefits for the environment. And as the program progressed, we were actually having people calling us and asking to get if they could get an award for what they had done. So we really felt uh, it had great traction. We tried to get a, an award in the paper almost every week, at least every two weeks, so that there was a constant drumbeat of why this sort of thing could really matter. And it really built awareness of uh, sustainability and climate action in, in our community. Uh, next slide. Uh, when It's important when you're trying to work with your uh, the city council, your elected officials, that you recognize that like in anything, almost anything in life, it takes a team of two, where it's the elected official who's going to be your champion as well as the staff person. We were fortunate to have our director of what we call our Department of Quality of Life. Uh, they're in charge of waste, uh, parks, and a variety of other uh, green activities. Really had a personal commitment to this, so even though he wasn't uh, assigned uh, per se to be our liaison, he, made, he became that staff connection that really made it uh, be, uh, successful. Uh, we've always, it's important to understand what are the hot buttons, if you will, for various council members. For all of them, we always emphasize the cost savings, as I mentioned previously. And the, for example, the study we did of our LE Streetlight project, which is underway now, we uh, really, our staff did a detailed analysis of the costs, uh, how much we would save, and a, and a, like a five-year plan through which we would implement it. We could show how it was going to be paid for as well as the savings to the general fund budget, and ultimately then uh, also indicating how, what the reduction in carbon emissions would be. Uh, I guess one last point here is just that elected officials, we as elected officials really need to be aware of staff time limitations. If, this, if climate action and the sustainability plan has not been made a top priority, say, by the, by the city manager, it's important to be able to work uh, into their, the overall staff program the time to, to commit to making this happen because it, it can take a fair amount of time and we've tried to minimize that. But since we've made sustainability part of our everyday budgeting practice, now most staff reports need to refer to how this will, will contribute to sustainability in the community. So it's been made part of the everyday work program of of analyzing a project and bringing that forward to the council for consideration. And I can't emphasize again uh, how important it is to work with the volunteers, taking advantage of their expertise and, and enthusiasm. 
Uh, it's been a, a real benefit here, and they are critical to building community-wide support. Next, next slide. So, uh, so how did we deal with any uh, naysayers uh, that we ran into? And we haven't had a, a, a really heavy backlash. Uh, the initial one of the uh, one couple of council members who flip-flopped on the issue, we just waited for them to knowing that they would be off the council in a few months. So that was one uh, tactic that worked. But we found that the community-based detractors really have two messages. You're creating too much government. Government is intruding on my business or my life and they look for what are in their mind are code words in the documents and that's uh, what we've had with our agenda 21 when they came to a few of our meetings reading our plan and pulling out the words that in their mind are part of the overall uh, UN driven conspiracy and the site that uh, I believe uh, Don ha had on his page about agenda 21 can really show you what some of those code words are so you can prepare for how to deal with that issue and as uh, both Don and Terry said, it's, you absolutely need to keep to your message. Uh, and that, that message is one that emphasizes everything you're doing is local. The things you're doing are going to save the money, the city money. And that you are dealing with not just renewable energy or not just energy efficiency, but climate change and sustainability deals with a great many other types of projects. We have a strong ethic here about trails, and uh, so we are really factoring that into our description of how we are dealing with sustainability and giving people alternative modes of means of transport tra travel. We've put a lot of effort into uh, making our fleet more, uh, uh, you know, less uh, less uh, contributing to pollution through the use of the c compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas, and we have used. Uh, funds where we've had them, our Recovery Act funds we use for a solar array to reduce the energy consumption of our wastewater plant. The other thing I would encourage is that you make sure everyone understands that participation in, in the various activities is entirely voluntary in nature because that's uh, it, the minute that uh, some of these detractors think you're trying to force something down their throat, you're going to raise one of those issues that Don was talking about that kind of becomes very emotional and you can't talk about the facts any longer. And then finally, uh, it having the plan, uh, we've been able to use it to show how having the, the sustainability plan and the particular actions in place and organized in a manner through the plan that we've been able to leverage, use that to leverage obtaining other funds. Part of that is uh, we're working with the Southern California Edison and the partnership program, and that's enabled us to bring in uh, several hundred thousand dollars and save tens of thousands of dollars each year in terms of our energy efficiency operation. And it's helped us get various state grants for park development or trail development as, as, as well. So there's a, you know, the first real surfacing of the Agenda 21 group in our community came with the very first meeting of the Resident Sustainability Network, and they, uh, the the moderator or, or facilitator of those sessions was totally effective in controlling any uh, negative input from that group by continually emphasizing that we were dealing with how are we going to deal with sustainability here in Redlands. We don't care about any of these other issues. We want to know what we want to do for our community. It was also interesting, we, we used a brainstorming process in that meeting. The, tent, the intent of the meeting was to get ideas within areas such as those in our plan where people would, what they envisioned in, in an area like local agriculture or a renewable energy, what they envisioned for the future of Redlands. And many of the Agenda 21 uh, people stayed around and actually participated in those roundtable discussions. So instead of it being one huge room where somebody could capture the floor, it was broken down into eight or ten tables. And so they didn't have a forum to uh, try to disrupt things had they wanted to. And they actually, many of them actually contributed to ideas of what they would like to see. However, when it got around to uh, actually forming the groups that would carry out the actions uh, that were came up, we reached through the meeting, by that time, all the Agenda 21 people had left, so I don't think any of them are involved in actually trying to bring about sustainability. But they at least, I th think, saw that, that that program was not threatening to them. Uh, next slide. So uh, 
ran through that kind of fast. Uh, I've got my contact information here for you if anybody uh, has some follow-up questions as well as a couple of links on our website for what we're doing in sustainability as well as how you can download a copy of our sustainability plan. So with that, thanks a lot, Kate. Appreciate it. Thanks, John, and we really appreciate having you and hearing the, the local story from the city of Redlands and how you were able to appropriately frame and communicate the goals of your projects and be successful in getting the plan passed and getting projects in motion. So we are actually out of time. I think each of the presenters offered to take any follow-up questions. Their emails are on the screen now if you do have any questions that you want to reach out to them or are looking for any more specifics on any of their tips and strategies or how they were able to have been able to implement some of these strategies um, in their, with their members and with their community members. So thanks to all our speakers for sharing with us today, and thanks to everyone who tuned in. We hope that you found it useful. Please take a few minutes to fill out the survey. When you close down your browser, it'll come up. As I mentioned, your input will be very helpful to us in future events. And that concludes our webinar today. Thank you. <laughs>